Before I start, I feel like I should make something very clear. I absolutely love Ellen. We've been living together for about three years now, but have known each other our whole lives. In fact, we were childhood friends, and I know this might sound like a fairy tale to some people, but it truly felt like we were always destined to be together. Even after graduation, when we started dating other people, it only felt truly right when we were with each other. So I don't know what took me so long to ask her out, but I'm really glad I did. We have the same taste in music, movies, and even food. We laugh at the same dumb jokes and know exactly how to comfort each other in times of need. She's the kindest, most gentle and loving girl I ever met. We've even been talking about our plans for marriage and how we would like to have kids of our own. That's why it hurt so much how it all went terribly wrong in just four nights. I would also like to preface that Ellen doesn't have much of a family other than me and some very distant aunts that she never met and doesn't even know their names. I was born in a big family with four siblings and plenty of cousins that were always visiting and even helping out when we got in trouble. Ellen has none of that. She doesn't have any siblings and her father was an alcoholic, abusive freak that died when she was young. Her mother was a very kind and inspiring person that took care of the family by herself for many years, and almost a second mother to myself. So when she passed away last year, it hurt us both for a long time. But Ellen stayed strong. She's not the type to let her feelings easily surface, so you gotta be a lot more perceptive to get what she truly feels. I used to proud myself in being capable of that. I felt like I knew her better than I knew myself, that's why all of this is so strange, and frankly, terrifying. We were sleeping in bed, and I was dreaming. I don't really remember what it was about, but for some reason, I'm sure of it, until I heard her voice very close to my ear. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. She was caressing my hair, gently, while sitting in bed and looking below at me. I slowly opened my eyes, groggy from sleep. Hey. What is it, baby? She kept looking at me, fixated, and repeated, Knock, knock. Knock, knock. I glanced at the digital clock on the top of the dresser. 3.27 a.m. I had work in only a few hours. What is it, Ellen? She paused. Please answer the joke, dear. Knock, knock. Knock, knock. Fine. I accepted, mostly because I was expecting some kind of surprise. Ellen wasn't the type to do what she was doing for no reason. Who's there? Her smile opened up, and she answered. Not me, so don't answer the door. I kept looking at her, dumbfounded. What was that supposed to mean? Is that it? Is that the joke? Yes, she said, laying in the couch and covering herself with a blanket. Thank you for answering. Weirdo, I answered, closing my eyes and going back to sleep. Next morning, things went as usual. I only remembered the strange conversation when I was alone in the bathroom, brushing my teeth, and wasn't even sure if any of it had truly happened or if it was just a weird dream. So we had our breakfast together, and she was acting normal, reading something aloud from a fashion magazine. Frankly, I wasn't paying much attention, so I took the opportunity to ask about last night. Initially, she didn't seem to know what I was talking about. Then her eyes fixated on me, and the same smile from last night crossed her face, briefly. And I knew it wasn't just a dream. She told me it wasn't anything of importance, and stopped paying attention when I asked more inquisitively. And even though I shouldn't, I gave up. I had work and other matters to attend to, and just brushed off the weird event, thinking it wouldn't happen again. But the following night, I woke up to her voice. Knock, knock. A pause. Knock. What is it now? I said. Ellen, what are you doing? Knock, knock. Knock, she repeated. This time, she wasn't even touching me. Just sitting in bed, looking at me with that same smile. But her eyes seemed larger, and she blinked in longer intervals. I looked at the clock. Once again, 3.27 a.m. Ellen, come on. What is it? I gotta work in a few hours, and I can't have the luxury of waking up in the middle of the night to answer knock-knock jokes. Knock, knock, knock. This is getting creepy, you know. I'm not sure if this is some gag you've been doing, but I don't like it. Answer it. 
Knock, knock. Knock. I sighed, but also let a small laugh escape. It was creepy, of course, but she was also my Ellen, so it didn't bother me as much as it should. Fine. Who the fuck is there? I answered in a playful tone. Not me. So don't answer the door. For some reason, I felt a chill down my spine. It was the same answer as before, and I still didn't get what it meant. But the way she said it, with a strange, monotone voice, contrasted well with her smile, and the fact that I had no idea of what she meant by that. What does that mean? I asked. I really don't get it. She just smiled and went back to sleep. I felt a throb in my heart, but did the same. Next day, we talked again about what was happening. She was very evasive with my questions, and I barely got her to say anything. It was almost as if she couldn't talk about it, which was very strange, considering we talk about pretty much everything. I told her I needed to be well rested for work, something she should understand well, and wasn't liking her little gag every night. She just nodded, and I decided not to press further, as I didn't want to hurt her feelings and had work to attend to. When I got back home, we had dinner, watched a movie, and went to bed. Knock, knock. I opened my eyes faster this time around. In fact, I barely got any sleep. I just knew she would do it again, and kept thinking about it the whole time. Glanced at the clock. 3.27 a.m. Knock, knock. I thought about ignoring her, just pretending I was asleep and she wouldn't wake me up. So I closed my eyes slowly, hoping that she hadn't seen me opening them up in the first place, and stayed quiet. Knock, knock. She continued. She didn't stop. I regulated my breathing, but she kept going. Knock, knock. I'm not answering your fucking joke, Ellen. Stop it. Knock, knock. I ignored, but she kept going. She had never been this insistent with anything before. I tried to ignore it, but it was getting on my nerves, and frankly, I felt scared. Why was Ellen doing this? Why, every night, at the same exact time down to the minute? Why wouldn't she let me sleep until I answered her? Knock, knock. I got up in a sudden movement. God damn it, Ellen. I was ready for a discussion, but when I finally glanced at her, it was as if the strength was drained from me. She wasn't smiling. She wasn't blinking. Just staring right at me, fixated like an animal. And her mouth was moving, slowly, and she didn't stop. Knock, knock. I didn't know how to react or what expression I had when I saw her, but my heart skipped a beat. It was terrifying, as if her gaze froze me in place. A thousand yard stare. Knock, knock. Who's there? I asked, feeling as if it was the only way out of that nightmare. Not me. So don't answer the door, she said weakly. Ellen slowly closed her eyes and laid down. I kept staring at her while she fell into what seemed to be a deep sleep. I got up and left. I walked downstairs and sat down at the couch in the living room, staring at the night sky outside and absorbing the quiet of the neighborhood. My heart was beating fast and it didn't slow down. I was just too scared to sleep in the same room as my girlfriend, all because of a f***ing knock-knock joke. But it was unnatural. I thought about calling someone. I thought about it all being some kind of sleep-related issue, such as some sort of sleepwalking, but it didn't make any sense. I felt so tired, and decided that early in the morning, I would call an old friend who's a psychologist and get the opinion of a professional. Something was wrong with Ellen. I stayed on the couch as the day rose, and once Ellen woke up, she was acting normal again. She even asked me why I wasn't in bed. I didn't answer. In fact, I didn't speak to her and simply left for work. She seemed very upset, but I wouldn't do anything about it. Once I got to work, I called my friend, told him everything that was happening in as much detail as I'm describing now. He didn't seem as worried as I figured, but we agreed in making an appointment for next week. Now I just needed to convince Ellen to come with me. I received plenty of text messages from her. He seemed very worried, sad, and even confused. He apologized a lot, and it broke my heart a little. I felt bad. I shouldn't have, but I answered her, and made her a promise it wouldn't happen again. I also told her about the appointment, and she seemed reluctant but agreed to go with me. So we made up. This was Ellen, after all. The girl I knew ever since I was six years old. The woman I loved, and that had taken care of me for years. And as much as that strange behavior creeped me out, she wasn't doing anything particularly frightening, or even dangerous. 
so for a brief while, I convinced myself I should give her another chance. When I returned home from work, we stayed together. We even prepared my favorite meal. Ellen was acting as gentle and caring as I always remembered, and I slept with her in our bedroom, even though I was still a bit reluctant. Knock. I couldn't believe it. She promised me she wouldn't. Knock. I gazed at the clock, 3.27 a.m. Always. Knock. I was laying on my stomach and I couldn't see her face. In fact, I didn't even bother to look at her. I was feeling more sad than scared at that point. Sad that she had broken her word. Knock. Who's there? I answered, determined to just go back to sleep. Not me, so don't answer the door. I stayed quiet and closed my eyes. I just hoped I would be able to handle it until the appointment next week. To my surprise, I was actually able to sleep probably because I hadn't been able to rest since last night. The following morning, I went back to not saying anything to Ellen, only very limited responses. I was expecting her to act the same as yesterday, trying to apologize, but she didn't. Mostly, she didn't say anything, almost as if she had accepted it. She also looked tired, or at least a bit weak. I went to work, but I couldn't stop thinking about her. Didn't receive any messages either. Once I got back, we had the most silent dinner I ever had in my life and she barely ate anything. I decided to let her have the bedroom and sleep on the couch. I wasn't sure if it would stop her, but held on to the hope that she wouldn't go downstairs only to tell me the same knock-knock joke again. I covered myself with a blanket, shaked off that uneasy feeling, and tried to sleep. I had a deep sleep, without dreams. Felt like I was lost in darkness. Then I heard breathing. I opened my eyes to see Ellen, standing above me, looking at me with big, fixated eyes and dilated pupils that didn't seem to belong in such a completely neutral expression. Watching me sleep. I almost screamed in terror, jumped off the couch, and her eyes followed me as I stumbled through the dark room, creating distance between us. For a moment, I was able to glance at the clock above the table, 3.27 a.m. Ellen, what are you doing? I asked, desperate, but she didn't move. In fact, she didn't say anything just stared at me, as if I was made of glass and she could see right through me. Then, I heard a knock on the front door. Instinctively, I looked in that direction. It was followed by another knock. And another. Someone almost pounding at the door. I glanced back at Ellen and she was still staring at me. Slowly, I got closer to the door and she didn't move. The pounding continued. Who's there? I screamed. It stopped. And then... I heard a voice. John? John, can you hear me? Open the door, please. John, please open the door. I froze in place. The voice kept calling me, but I couldn't believe it. It was Ellen's voice, coming from the other side of the door. But it couldn't be. I beg you, John, open the door. It's serious. She's not me, I swear. She's not me. Slowly, I turned my head to look at Ellen, standing in front of the couch. She was looking at me the same fixated eyes and a terrible, wide grin across her face. The pounding continued. John, open the door. Please, you have to trust me. I stayed still, not knowing what to do, and I don't remember what happened after that. I just woke up in my bedroom. The digital clock indicates it's 4.21 a.m. Ellen isn't by my side. I'm completely alone. I'm trembling, uncontrollably, and don't know what's going on. I don't remember what happened after I saw her terrible grin. I don't know if I opened the door. I tried looking for my phone, see if I could call the police, or at least someone that I know. But I left it downstairs. All I have is Ellen's laptop, and it's where I'm writing this right now to get advice. Because I can't go downstairs. The corridor is dark. Very dark. Almost as if the shadows were leaning into the room. And I can hear a faint scratching sound coming from below. What should I do? I'm posting this as a warning. There are things out there that you don't want to know about. Stay away from them. Don't go looking for them. I'll tell you my story in hopes that it will quench your curiosity. It was a night like any other night, at least lately. I had barely arrived at the ranger station and there were already four calls of vacationers' homes getting broken into. Out here in the West Virginia Wildlife Preserve, 
people tend to think that just because they plant some houses, that the animals should somehow know and respect boundaries. That's kind of tough when the animals are on a huge plot of land where they've never been hunted and never even been threatened by anything other than a bigger animal. Folks seem to think this is a great vacation spot for them. What they don't realize is it's also a great vacation spot for the animals. I hopped in the company truck and started towards my first destination for the night. An elderly couple had been terrorized by a deer that literally broke in through a sliding glass door. They managed to trap it in a side room and needed someone to go to release it. I got elected. When I got there, the vacationers looked like the ones caught in the headlights. They were still wide-eyed. I could tell they were in shock. I had them go into another room and close the door. Once they were out of the way, I found the closest door to the outside and opened it. Then I went to the room with the deer in it. I slowly opened the door and was shocked to find the room covered in blood. The deer was laying on the floor panting. I approached it slowly, circling around to leave the doorway open, hoping to give it an escape route. The closer I got, the more I realized this deer wasn't going anywhere. Its side was covered with claw marks. At first, I thought a coyote had attacked it, but the marks were too far apart. They were large enough to be caused by a bear, but the individual claws were too far apart. I'd never seen anything like this. If I had to compare it to something, I'd say Freddy Krueger sliced it up. The deer's eyes went wide when I approached it, but it didn't jump up and run. I took this as a bad sign. Its breath came in ragged gasps as I struggled to roll it over. Once I did, it was my turn to struggle breathing. Its entire side was torn to shreds, but that wasn't the worst part. There were large chunks that were missing. I examined the wounds and found bite marks where the missing flesh should have been, but the bites were massive. If it wouldn't have challenged the laws of nature, as well as my own sanity, I would have said it was bitten by a shark. Blood poured out of the side and the deer struggled to draw breath. I stood and left the room, leaving the poor creature the dignity of a private death. When I went back in, it was still. I took pictures with my cell phone and tried my best to carry the creature out without making more of a mess. After I got it loaded on the back of my truck, I went back inside and talked to the vacationers. When I opened the door to the room they were in, the woman's eyes grew wide and she started screaming. The man's eyes were the size of saucers as well. I approached them slowly with my arms outstretched to try to calm them down. It seemed to have the opposite effect. They started climbing the furniture and clawing at the walls to get away from me. I decided to back away and give them some room. What's wrong? I said. The man pointed a shaky finger at me. You, you, you're covered in blood, he said. The deer got you, the woman said. You've got rabies. Or worse, the man said, keeping his distance. I'm sorry, folks, I said. This is the deer's blood. You killed it just for breaking in? The woman said. What? No, it was already injured. I just took it to my truck. The couple seemed to settle down and consider this. So, you don't have rabies? The man said, slowly looking me up and down. Or anything else? The woman said, hiding behind her husband. No, ma'am. I'm fine. She took her turn eyeing me up and down, I assumed looking for wounds. Being satisfied, they asked the one question I didn't want to hear. So what killed the deer? The man said. I really don't know, I said truthfully. Having just gotten them calmed down, I didn't want to send them back into a panic. It was probably just a coyote, I said. A coyote? The man said, diving back into the pool of panic. Or a bear. I said, trying and failing to calm them. A bear? The woman said, diving in after her husband. You know, folks, you've had a traumatic night, I said. I can't tell you what to do, but if I were you, I'd- We are leaving, the woman said, dragging her husband out of the room. That sounds like a good idea, I said. And then like an idiot, I added, I hope you enjoyed your stay. They either didn't hear me or ignored me. Either way, it wasn't long until I heard a car start, then roar away from the house. I went back into the room where the deer had been trapped and started working backwards from there, trying to find out what had happened. It wasn't hard to pick up the trail. It had been bleeding badly. Seeing the bites and claw marks made that fairly obvious. 
I tracked back through the kitchen and out the smashed glass door. Once outside, I turned on my flashlight. The trail was a little harder to follow, but not much. I could still see drops of blood besides its tracks as I followed them back toward the pond behind the house. I approached the pond and saw signs of a struggle. This must have been where the deer was attacked. There were other tracks in with the deers, but they didn't make sense to me. They were large, too large. Their shape was odd as well. If I had to call them anything, I would have called them duck prints, but massive, larger than any duck by many times. A giant duck with shark teeth. I think I'll leave that out of my report, I thought. It suddenly struck me what the tracks were. It was a man with swim fins on his feet. But why? Why go through all that trouble to poach a deer when you can just knock it out with a tranquilizer gun? My mind sent me an answer, but I didn't like it. What if the man is a psychopath, just getting his kicks by killing an animal with his bare hands? I thought about the mental hospital in the neighboring county and wondered if one of their patients had taken an unsanctioned leave of absence and they were trying to keep it quiet. I didn't like that thought one bit. Aside from the fact that it didn't explain the huge bites on the deer, It also meant we had someone who might suddenly get a taste for killing. Doing this to animals was horrible, but what if he decided to go after something bigger? I shot a look at the house wondering how many vacationers were within a short walk from this spot and how many were armed. As I contemplated the safety of the people in the area, I heard something behind me. I whipped around and shone my light but saw nothing. I scanned the pond and saw a ripple emanating from the middle probably just a fish jumping. I took some more pictures of the struggle area with my phone, then started back toward my truck. I had more calls to answer and this riddle would have to wait. I drove halfway around the lake, around three miles, to the other vacation home where a break-in had been reported. When the woman in her thirties answered the door, she took a step back. Oh my, she said, looking at the dried blood all over my uniform. Good evening, ma'am. Sorry about my appearance. I said. Did you report a break-in? Yes, we did. Please come in, she said in a friendly tone. It gave me a wide berth while closing the door. She led me upstairs to the kitchen. For some reason, I was expecting to find blood all over like with the last house. However, this was a completely different mess. She showed me the door. It had been forced open but not shattered like the last one. There was only a small amount of glass broken. Then the door latch had been unlocked and the door slid open. There were faint images of my giant duck tracks like the last house. My spine turned to ice. This house was over three miles away from the other. There were many more people in that space that might have fallen victim to this crazed person. The woman showed me the rest of the kitchen and the mess that had been left. There were a few cans of sardines that had been opened and eaten, and also some cans of tuna fish. The strange thing was how they were opened. The cans had been torn into with something sharp, but not a can opener. The marks looked like they were torn open with claws. I shuddered to imagine the amount of strength it took to do something like that. And then I spotted it. Beside one of the cans of tuna was a small puddle of blood. Ma'am, could I trouble you for a sandwich bag? I said. She handed me one and I carefully tried to scrape as much blood into it as possible. I sealed it and put it in my pocket, then went out through the broken door. Behind the house, just like with most of these vacation houses, there was a pond. I traced the tracks back to it and they disappeared at the waterline. I shone my light over the water, but the only thing I saw was a stray turtle. I stared at it for a long time as though it would somehow give me a clue as to what was going on. What should we do? The woman said, nearly scaring me half to death. I hadn't heard her follow me out the door and into the yard. I'll send someone around to look at the door in the morning, I said. In the meantime, it might not be a bad idea to sleep in a room that has a lock on the door. I'm sure they won't be back, but just in case. You didn't seem very comforted by that idea, but thanked me as I left. The next two reports were just teenagers breaking in and stealing beer. That was it. No bloody wildlife, no weird tracks, just kids being kids. I went back to the station, changed out of my bloody uniform, and spent the rest of the night filing out reports on what had happened. When my shift was over and I passed on what had happened, I took a little trip to the neighboring county. I stopped in at the mental hospital and asked if they had any escapees lately. 
The nurse looked at me like I had asked her if she was wearing deodorant. We don't have escapes, she said, with obvious pride that showed as arrogance. I thanked her and left, feeling less than satisfied with her answer. Next, I stopped in at the local police department and asked one of my friends on the force if they could analyze the blood sample for me. I shared my thoughts that there might be an escapee from the mental hospital, and the blood sample might help us find out who and track him down. It was well past noon until I got to bed. That night, when I got to work, it was pandemonium. There had been more break-ins and people were starting to panic. The owner of the resort was frantic. People were canceling left and right and wanting their money back. When I walked in, he stormed his pudgy face right up into mine. You told people to go home? He fumed, glaring up at me. I merely suggested, do you want to pay their rental out of your salary? I work for the state, not you, I said. He turned a deeper shade of red. Would you rather see people in body bags instead of animals? I said. That wouldn't do much for business now, would it? He turned fire engine red and stormed out, mumbling, we'll see. I investigated five break-ins that night. Only two of them were legit. The rest seemed like half-hearted attempts to stage a break-in so they could get out of paying for the rental. The two real ones shared the same characteristics as before. Just enough of a broken window to open the door. The cans of whatever seafood was available. They even got shrimp out of the freezer. Everything about the way the intruder acted pointed to a person. All I needed to know was who. Again, I followed the tracks back to a nearby pond. I stood for a long time studying the surface of the water. I knew these ponds were all designed the same. A roughly 40 yard by 40 yard body of water, around 5 feet deep, in the middle, stocked with mostly bluegill for catch and release fishing. Anyone using these ponds to hide would have to be holding their breath for inhuman periods of time. I stared at the surface for 20 minutes. If someone was out there, they had an invisible snorkel or an extra set of lungs. After my rounds of investigating and reporting, I decided to stick around and do a little extra investigating. I ran home, grabbed my swim trunks, mask, and snorkel, and went to the site of the most recent break-in. I waded out into the water, unsure of what I would find, when a snake slithered past me. I let it go and waded deep enough to where I could swim. I hovered at the level of the surface dipping my mask underwater to get a glimpse of whatever there was to see. There wasn't much. Fish, underwater plants, and lots of water. Just what you would expect from a pond. As I kept going towards the middle, the water was getting deeper. I know I couldn't touch the bottom. I had to float on the surface. Looming in front of me was a dark spot on the bottom of the pond. I took it for a rock but swam close enough to investigate anyway. In for a penny, in for a pound. As I drew close enough to hover over it, I realized it wasn't a rock. I took a deep breath and dove to find out what it was. The further I swam down, the further I was able to swim down. I kept going and going. Light disappeared. I was sure I had been swimming straight down for a solid minute without touching the bottom. I turned and looked up. The surface of the pond was only a pinprick of light. My lungs screamed at me to turn around. I had no choice but to comply. I clawed at the water in desperation. It seemed like I was swimming in mud or something was pulling me down, almost like a force or current pushing against me, wanting me to drown before I could fully explore this hidden secret. After what felt like an eternity, I broke the surface of the water and gasped for air. I swam over to the shallows and walked out of the pond. I collapsed on the shore and lay there for a long time trying to regain my breath. As my brain received enough oxygen, I thought about what had happened and if it had been real, an illusion, or if I had just gotten turned around somehow and stuck at the bottom. I had to find out. I wasted no time driving two counties over and renting some dive equipment, along with a light. So armed, I returned to the pond and walked towards the middle again. This time, when I dove toward the dark spot, I was able to see exactly what it was. I used the flashlight to examine the darkness. As I swam deeper, the sides closed in on me as if I was swimming down the gullet of some massive fish. I've never been claustrophobic before, but that was rapidly changing. I barely had any room to maneuver as the sides closed in. I contemplated turning around, but there was no room. I could feel myself start to panic. I had to focus to keep my breaths regular. I was very close to a panic attack when suddenly the tunnel opened up again. 
the sides grew further apart. I checked my watch and I had been under for 15 minutes. The sides of the tunnel had spread out so far they were barely visible and I could see a light ahead of me. I swam toward it, desperate to get out of this water. I broke the surface and looked around. I was in the pond. Somehow, I had gotten turned around and was back in the pond. I swam to the side until I could stand and walked out to the shore. Looking around, I made a startling discovery. I was in a pond. The same one as the break-in last night. Somehow, there was a hidden tunnel between the two ponds. That's how the robber never gets caught. He just swims to the next pond like as snot. No fuss, no muss. I now knew the how, but I needed to know more. As tempting as it was to swim back through the tunnel, I was still a little shaken and didn't want to risk an underwater panic attack. I walked back to my truck, took off my dive equipment, and drove back to the dive shop. I asked about frequent customers, especially for refilling tanks. They told me they had a few regulars that came in every weekend, but no one knew and no one who needed to refill more than once a week. I asked if there were any other dive shops in the area and they told me the next closest one was over a hundred miles away. I went home frustrated. It wasn't making sense. He would need air to swim back and forth through that tunnel and that was his escape route, I was sure of it. I tried to sleep through the afternoon, but my mind wouldn't let me rest. It was working on the impossible puzzle of how the robber was getting air. I borrowed a couple trail cams and set one up at each pond. I needed to see if he had some new tank system or what. I also wanted to identify him and shut him down fast. I made sure to stay away from those ponds that night so he would feel free to do his thing. In the morning I gathered the cameras and took them home. I downloaded both memory cards before watching the video. Just as the second download was finished, my phone rang. Hello? I said. Hey John, it's Steve. I got the results from that blood you gave me the other day. Great. I said hitting the play button on my computer. Were you able to get a match on any hospital records? Not exactly. Why not? I asked as a ghostly green image appeared on my computer. The image was blurred but it was definitely the size of a man walking upright toward the camera. I clicked to the next slide and froze at what I saw. Well, the thing is, the blood you gave me came back as reptile DNA. I registered the words he said in my mind, just like I registered the image on my computer screen but I just couldn't place them in reality. Are you there? He said into the phone. Yes, I'm sorry. I said. Could you send a copy of your findings to my office? Sure, no problem. Thanks, I appreciate it. You really helped me figure this out. Anytime, he said cheerfully before hanging up. I hadn't taken my eyes off the computer screen the whole time. No matter how long I stared at it, I couldn't make my mind acknowledge it as real. Standing there, large as life, was not a man in a wetsuit. It was a creature. I could see the wide mouth full of sharp teeth that looked exactly like the bites on the deer. I could see the webbed feet that looked like swim fins, only they had claws sticking out at the front where toes should be. I saw the razor-sharp claws on its webbed hands. It was a full-on nightmare staring me in the face. I sat back and thought for a long time. Then I printed copies of the images and put them in an envelope. I rushed to the station to share the information I had with my fellow rangers. As I was showing them, their faces ranged in emotions from shock to disbelief to outright mocking. As I was going through my investigation, the owner of the timeshares walked in. What are we all looking at? He said, eyeing me with contempt. It seems like John has solved the case of the break-ins, one of the other rangers said. The owner approached, he picked up the lab report and read it, then stared for a long time at the picture. Do you know what this is? He said absently. I really don't know yet, I said. I've never seen anything like it. He turned to me and smiled. This is money, he said holding up the picture. What do you mean? I said. Those idiots that go around hunting, what do they call them? Cryptids? Yeah, cryptids. They'll pay through the nose if they think they can find something like this. And then there's TV shows and merchandising, he said. You may have saved my financial hide. He beamed at me. I don't think you understand, I said. This is a dangerous animal. If you had seen what it did to that deer. So what do you want me to do? Hunt it down and kill it? Maybe not kill it, but definitely tranquilize it and take it to a secure location where it can't hurt anyone. You dumb son of a shit, he yelled, 
I could make a mint. I wouldn't even have to repair those houses. They would all rush in to investigate and leave piles of cash in my bank account. But what about the people? Who cares about the people? He said, throw them all out. I've got the chance of a lifetime beating down my front door and you want to flush it down the toilet because you're scared someone might break a nail. He was breathing hard and staring up into my face. The air was charged with fury, his and mine. And then a sudden calm came over him. Charles, he said, addressing the lead ranger. Isn't this a wildlife preserve? Yes, it is, Charles said warily. And aren't the wildlife on this preserve protected from all tampering by law? Well, I guess so, Charles said. What if those animals present a threat? I said to Charles. How many deer were killed by coyotes on this preserve last year? The owner said. Dozens, Charles said. Were those coyotes removed from the preserve? No, Charles said. The owner turned and shot me a triumphant look. John, Charles said. I know you have everyone's best interests in mind, but you're going to have to let this go. I glared at him. And what happens when this thing decides it likes to eat humans? All the eyes in the room that had been on me suddenly found somewhere else to look, all but the owner. He was smiling from ear to ear. I think the pudgy little brissad was about to break into a happy dance. I searched the room for any support, but found none. I pulled my badge off my shirt, quietly laid it on the desk, and left. If that was the end of my story, I would say I had failed. I took my pension and rented one of those houses on the preserve. The owner had leaked through social media that a cryptid had been spotted on the preserve. As he had guessed, the cryptid hunters and TV crews came in droves, renting everything in sight. My goal was different. I already knew it existed. I knew how it got around without being detected. I stayed at one of the break-in houses. Every night I took a huge tuna I had bought fresh that morning and laid it out beside the pond. I sat in the dark living room and watched the first night as it approached the fish with more caution than curiosity. After sniffing it for a long time, it grabbed it and dove for the pond. Each night after, I laid out a fish and the creature became less cautious. It was being fed and the media frenzy was starving. The hunters had found nothing. There were no sightings as long as I fed it. Everyone had their cameras set up. The few that roamed around left me alone when they saw someone in the house. I guess they thought I was another cryptid hunter and respected my privacy. As the number of sightings stayed at zero, they started turning on the owner, calling him a fraud. His reputation plummeted. After a week with no sightings, people started leaving. In desperation, he did the wrong thing. He hired an actor to dress in a creature suit and roam around. Of course the hunters and shows saw right through this and destroyed what was left of his reputation. I had rented the house for two weeks. Between the rent and the fish, my money was running out. I had kept the people safe, but what would happen when I stopped feeding it? I had managed to clear out most of the people so they would be safe, but what about my fellow rangers? What would happen when it became desperate? When the starving creature no longer had houses full of food to break into? I had three more nights until I had to leave. I was out of money. The preserve had become a ghost town. As far as I knew, I was the only renter left. It was decision time. I sat staring at the large tuna on the table with a bottle of bleach next to it. Let it live and see what happens, or kill it. I thought about this for a long time. Both options had merits and consequences. I chose a third option, a much more dangerous one. I took the fish out and laid it where I usually did, then backed up a few feet and stood there. Over an hour passed before the water stirred. I saw the head and eyes of the creature appear as it headed toward the fish, and then it stopped. It had seen me. I made sure to keep still with my arms at my side. I slowly approached and stood. It was a few feet away with the fish in between us. It studied me and sniffed the air, then became agitated. Perhaps it had smelled my scent before as a pursuer. It let out a soft hiss, but bent down and took the fish, keeping its eyes on me the entire time. Then, once it had its meal, it did the most incredible physical display I've ever seen. It leaped 20 feet in the air and landed in a perfect dive right in the middle of the pond, leaving almost no splash. I let out a breath I didn't realize I'd been holding and collapsed to the ground shaking. Once I had recovered, I went back inside and fell into a fitful sleep. That was only part of my plan. The next night would decide who lived and who died. I did exactly like the night before, minus the fish. 
the creature approached, stepped up to me, and looked around for the fish. I showed it my empty hands. It sniffed at them and growled having smelled the scent of fish. It looked at my hands and I wondered if it was going to bite them off as a substitute. It hissed at me and sniffed my face. I saw it flexing its claws the whole time. I stared into its face, those massive razor sharp teeth, and swallowed hard. I did all I could to stay still, to show it I wasn't a threat. My heart hammered in my chest. It opened its jaws and showed me those horrible teeth. Its breath was a horrid stench I had never smelled and hoped to never again. I closed my eyes not knowing if they would ever open. Seconds fell into minutes. I opened my eyes and I was alone. There wasn't even a ripple in the water. I sighed. My decision had been made. It had shown restraint and I would too. I went back inside, packed and left. I could only hope and pray that the people that remained, including my former co-workers, would be safe. I went home and slept restlessly. In the morning there was a report in the newspaper on a break-in at the wildlife preserve. They said the only thing that was taken were cans of tuna fish. I smiled ruefully and wondered how long it would stay that way. If you are reading this, don't go looking for this thing. If you see it, don't tell others about it. Just leave it alone and hope for the best. In the summer of 1976, I said goodbye to my mom, who never took her eyes off the magazine she was reading. He simply gave a curt wave that said, You don't have to be home by dinner, but be safe and have fun. Then, I walked out the front door and hopped into the passenger seat of the red Challenger that belonged to my best friend, Jonathan Belvedere. Ten minutes later, Jonathan parked his Challenger outside the home of Rachel Lafferty, our other good friend and seconds later, Rachel was getting into the back seat, a huge grin on her face. But there was a hint of sadness in that grin, like a rose that was starting to wilt just slightly. Then, turning to both Rachel and I, Jonathan perfectly summed up why that sad smile was there. Well, boys and girl, it's the final summer, Jonathan said sagely. One last hurrah for the three musketeers. Don't say that, Rachel said, and now she really did look sad. It's not the end. It's... it's... it's a new beginning, I added, giving them both a weak smile. Sure, Jonathan said, winking at us both and putting the Challenger in drive. To new beginnings. And then his Challenger sped off down the road on that bright summer day, loud and powerful, no doubt giving some of Rachel's neighbors alarm. In fact, one of Rachel's neighbors, who was mowing his lawn, shouted at us, shouted at us to slow down as we flew by. Everyone in town knew Jonathan's car. It was instantly recognizable due to the yellow smiley face he had painted on the driver door. We had all just graduated high school, and this was the last summer before we each went our separate ways. Rachel would be attending the University of Madison in the fall. I would be attending the less prestigious technical college, but my parents were still proud that I was going to college anyways. Jonathan wasn't attending college at all. He was going to move to Milwaukee to work at an auto shop his uncle owned. None of us would ever end up doing those things. But as Jonathan's challenger bore us out of the suburbs like a bat out of hell, we didn't know that. We knew that the times were changing to be sure, and that the three musketeers were splitting up. But there must still be good times ahead, right? And on that bright summer day, it was easy to believe that easy to believe in new beginnings. We lived in Dutchville, Wisconsin. If you were to visit Dutchville today, you'd find a thriving town that has all the hustle and bustle that comes along with strip malls and movie theaters that bring food right over to your seat, and there are apartment complexes everywhere. But back in the 70s, I'm not sure you could even quite call Dutchville a town. More of a hodgepodge of small suburbs, one school, and one downtown area. And when you left all that behind, there was nothing but farms, fields, and roads. So many roads. An intricate web of roads that sprawled all across the country. It was through that web of roads that we drove, blasting music in Jonathan's car and laughing. The plan was simple. We would drive around for a bit, then find a spot to hang. But for how long did we drive? Twenty minutes? 
30? 45? An hour? I honestly couldn't say. Time seemed to move strange that day. I can only say that after an indeterminate amount of time, Jonathan slowed his car down. To our right was an old-looking gravel road. There was a frail-looking wooden street sign at its beginning. Written over the wood in crude black letters were the words, Sparrow Road. Sparrow Road, Jonathan said bemused. I don't think I've ever been down this road before. Me neither, I said, which was strange considering that ever since Jonathan got his license a few years back, we had spent countless weekends driving around our small town. To discover a new road wasn't just bizarre, it was plain eerie. But Jonathan, who now had a look in his eyes that was not unlike some great explorer who had just discovered a hidden Aztec city, turned the steering wheel and the car lurched over the gravel road. The gravel made a terrible crunching noise underneath the tires. Uh, maybe we shouldn't, Rachel said from the back seat. I got a funny feeling about this. Rachel's funny feelings were not to be taken lightly. Once in 8th grade, we had discovered a fairly big tree in the woods outside of town. The kind of tree that was perfect for climbing. Jonathan and I began climbing the tree, but Rachel said that we shouldn't. That she just had a funny feeling was all. She got really scared and so Jonathan and I stopped climbing and left the woods with her. Not 30 minutes later, a surprise storm came out over the town. When we went into the woods the next day, the tree we had been climbing had been struck down by lightning. The tree, which had seemed so large and ancient the day before, had now been reduced to blackened wood, and had we not listened to Rachel that day, Jonathan and I might have burned along with it. There were other moments since then, smaller moments, but moments when Rachel's funny feeling came in handy. Uh, maybe Rachel's right, I said. It's fine, Padre, Jonathan said, using to ignore Rachel's warning. He occasionally liked to call me Padre, because one time in 7th grade, I jokingly said I wanted to become a priest. The car began to pick up speed. What better way to spend the final summer than explore some strange roads, eh? We'll just cruise for a little bit, and then find a place to hang. Rachel said nothing, but when I turned to look at her, she had a worried look on her face. I don't know how long we cruised down that terrible gravel road. I only know that the sound of the gravel crunching underneath the Challenger's tires seemed to grow louder and louder the more we went along, and Sparrow Road seemed to stretch on for an eternity. At one point, we came across an abandoned car. Looks old, Rachel said as we passed it. That was an understatement. The car looked ancient, like something from the early 1900s. Groovy, Jonathan said. He whistled and kept driving. But eventually, Jonathan did bring the car to a stop. On our right was nothing but a field of green grass. On our left was the same, except jutting out of the grass, just a few feet from the road was a stone well. This looks like a good spot as any, Jonathan said, turning off the car. We gathered up our goods, that is the beer Jonathan had stored in the car, and got out. The stone well had a small roof over it, and just a little bit below the roof was a bar looped with rope. On the bar's right end was a wheel crank that when turned would ease the rope down into the well. Sitting on top of the well's roof was a big black crow. It cawed as we approached. Jonathan shooed it, but it only flew a few feet away and regarded us reproachfully with its head cocked to the side. The three of us looked down into the well. The mouth of the well was wide. Very, very wide. I'll never forget the shivers that went up my back as we looked into it. You couldn't see the bottom of the well. The wall seemed to go down for a few feet, and then there was nothing but blackness stretching into infinity. No sign of any water either. No plausible way to tell how deep it went, not with your eyes at least. And there was something terrible about that darkness. You stared down into the well, and the well seemed to stare back. Hello? 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 Jonathan yelled into the darkness and his voice echoed and then faded. Trippy stuff, Jonathan said, grinning. Creepy, Rachel said. You can't see the bottom. Eh, it's just a trick of the light, Jonathan said. Then, turning away from the well, he took three beers out of his bag and handed one to both Rachel and I. We toasted, and we drank. What road were we on? Rachel said some time later. Huh? Jonathan replied. He was sitting on the lip of the well, smoking a cigarette. 
Rachel and I were sitting in the grass. There were crumpled beer cans all around us. Before we came out to Sparrow Road, what road were we on? Oh, Jonathan said. The end of his cigarette was beginning to droop lamely, and he ashed it into the well. I don't remember. Do you remember? Rachel said, looking at me. I shook my head. I tried to think, but I honestly couldn't remember. Neither can I, Rachel continued. And now she sounded as worried as she looked. I don't know where we are right now. I don't like being here. We're on Sparrow Road, Jonathan said flatly. But where is Sparrow Road? Rachel responded. Jesus, Rachel, Jonathan said, spreading his hands out. It's somewhere in Dutchville County, obviously. Maybe Rachel's right, I said. Maybe we should head back. Remember the tree? Don't give me the tree again, Jonathan said, and he threw his entire cigarette into the well. I know you guys must think you're so much smarter than me, because you got into college and all. Jonathan, that's not at all. Rachel tried to say, but she was cut off. But I'm not as dumb as you might think, Rachel Lafferty. And if I am, then who better to recognize dumb luck than a dummy himself? Because that tree thing? That was pure dumb luck. And you've been holding that over our heads for too up long. And I do remember what road we were on. We were on Mulberry. We were on Mulberry, and then we turned onto Sparrow Road. But he didn't sound as if he believed it. And the three of us had driven down Mulberry Road multiple times. There had never been a gravel road that went off Mulberry. A terrible silence overtook the three of us. It was broken when Jonathan began laughing. I'm sorry, guys, Jonathan said. I'm being a great a asshole right now. Kinda have been the whole drive, Rachel said, but not unkindly, and she was smiling. So I'm start for the final summer, huh? Jonathan said, meeting her smile. And then the three of us started laughing. It was the last good laugh I remember having. Then, after our laughter subsided, Jonathan said, You're right, though. This place is creepy. Let's head back. Really? Rachel said. Really? Jonathan replied. Memories are a funny thing. I've played back what happens next in my head multiple times. Played it over and over again. Sometimes that stupid crow is back on the roof of the well. And when it calls, it surprises Jonathan. Other times, the crow isn't there at all. But regardless of the variations in my memory, the result is always the same. Rachel and I stand up on the grass, and as Jonathan gets up from the lip of the stone well, he loses his balance. His hands slip as he tries to grab the well. He falls backwards. He falls into the well. Jonathan didn't scream as he fell backwards. He simply made a short, gasping noise. The back of his head hit the rope bar, and then he fell down into the gaping maw of the well. Rachel and I immediately rushed to the well and looked down. There was no sign of Jonathan. There was one horrible moment where Rachel and I didn't say anything. I think because morbidly, we were both waiting for the sound of him hitting the bottom of the well. But no sound ever came. And then Rachel and I began screaming. We began screaming Jonathan's name, begging him to answer us. But there was no reply. Only darkness stared up at us. We need to get help, I said. And then a sick realization came over me. Oh, Jesus, Rachel. Jonathan had the keys. I stared over at Jonathan's challenger. The yellow smiley face on the driver door seemed to stare back at me, mockingly. I'll run, I said. I'll run as fast as I can to town and I'll get help. I was already beginning to move. Wait, Rachel said. Just wait. She walked over to the wheel crank and began to turn it. Rope began to pull down. What are you doing? I asked, mortified as Rachel began to tie the rope around her waist. Do you remember my cousin Anton? Rachel asked. Uh, vaguely? I said. Look, Rachel, I went to visit Anton a couple of summers ago. My uncle has a farm, and they have a ground well just like this on their land. Anton is a couple years younger than us, and he's not that bright. He fell into the well. I was the one that found him because I heard him screaming. My uncle told my aunt to go get help. But do you know what my uncle did? He went down into the well. He stayed down there with Anton for hours. Later that night, he told me that getting a person out of a well isn't the tricky part. It's making sure they are still alive when you bring them up that's hard. Do you understand? Bringing Anton up wasn't the priority. Stopping the bleeding was. Jonathan is down there, 
and he's probably bleeding. We can't just leave him down there. And I think, I think we're far, very, very far from Dutchville, or from anyone. It'll take a long time to run and get help. If we both run, then there might not be a Jonathan to bring up by the time we get back with help. So before you leave, you're going to lower me down that well, and I'm going to help Jonathan, because he's probably unconscious down there, and he's probably bleeding. Jesus Christ, Rachel, you want to go down there? It's not that deep, Rachel said, staring down the well. She sounded as if she was talking more to herself than me. It's just a trick of the light. Wells are never that deep. The one Anton fell into wasn't that deep. Rachel didn't mention that she had probably been able to see Anton at the bottom of the well he had fallen into. There was no seeing the bottom of this well. Someone has to stop the bleeding. Rachel had swung both her legs over the well and was now dangling over the darkness. In some ways, she looked like bait that was about to be swallowed up by a great white shark. Or in this case, a great stone worm. Are you sure about this? I asked nervously. Rachel nodded. The moment I reach the bottom, you run and get help. I put both hands on the crank wheel and began to turn. Rachel began to lower into the well. After a moment, her feet dipped into the darkness. For some odd reason, I expect her to make some kind of noise, like a person makes when they first step into a cold pool. But Rachel said nothing. A moment later, her legs were swallowed by the darkness, then her torso. Rachel stared up at me with those bright blue eyes of hers, and then those two went into the darkness. Just a trick of the light. I stopped the crank for a moment and yelled down the well, Rachel, are you okay? Not being able to see her made me so frightened. I immediately regretted lowering her down and was about to bring the rope up. I'm okay, Rachel responded, but her voice sounded so far away, as if she was at the end of a very long tunnel, which didn't seem right at all considering I had only lowered her a few feet into the well. Keep going. I continued to turn the crank. Deeper and deeper Rachel went into the well, though I couldn't see it. I could only watch as the rope pulled down from the bar. I still haven't reached the bottom yet, Rachel called up. At least this is what I thought I heard. It was incredibly hard to hear her now. She sounded so far. Wait, hold on, there's... Rachel? I yelled down the well. What is it? There came no reply, except for my own echo. It. 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 Rachel? 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 Rachel, if you don't respond, I'm bringing you back up. 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 Not being able to stand Rachel's silence and the horrible sound of my own echo, I immediately began to reverse steer the crank and pull the rope up. The moment I did, I could tell something was wrong. The rope felt much lighter than it should have. I turned the wheel like a madman. I could already feel my fingers starting to blister. And then the end of the rope receded out of the darkness and into the light of the day. It was no longer tied around Rachel. It wasn't tied around anything. And Rachel was nowhere to be seen. I stared numbly at the end of the rope, which now looked frayed, as if it had been cut or chewed by something. I looked down the well, and that terrible empty darkness stared back. At some point, Rachel had become untied and fell further into the well, but like Jonathan, there came no sound of her hitting the bottom, if there even was a bottom. I screamed down the well. I screamed for both Rachel and Jonathan, but again, I was only met with the sound of my own echo. For one insane moment, I thought of lowering the length of the entire rope into the well and then climbing down it like some kind of firefighter. But the thought disappeared as I stared down into the darkness. It was replaced by another thought. I could feel a strange pulling sensation in the back of my head, and as I stared down the well, it was almost as if the darkness was slowly rising to greet me. Just fall in, the thought in the back of my head said. It spoke in a clear voice, almost too clear to be only a thought. Just fall in and ride the endless well. Jonathan and Rachel are down here. They are falling. They'll always be falling. Higher and higher the darkness climbed. I continued to stare down at it, as if in a trance. I could feel myself leaning over the lip of the well, leaning further and further in. Just fall. 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 I was so close to falling in when... I heard the sound of a crow calling. It broke the trance. I immediately became aware of how far I was leaning over the well 
and backed away. The crow, and it was undoubtedly the same crow we saw when we first came to the well, continued to call. It sounded like laughter, malicious laughter. That was enough. I ran away screaming. I ran for what felt like an endless amount of time. At some point, though, I did reach the end of the gravel road. I continued to run, searching for help, screaming for it. Nothing around me looked familiar at all, and there wasn't a soul in sight. The roads were completely empty. I think we're far, very, very far from Dutchville, or from anyone. We had left my home at around 9.45 a.m. It had been a bright, beautiful summer day. When I finally stumbled across the diner, it was pitch black outside. When I first saw the diner, I wasn't sure if it was real. I had the same feeling that a man who had been roaming the desert might feel when suddenly coming across a beautiful oasis. Was it some terrible trick? A cruel mirage? I had been running around empty roads for who knows how long, and now suddenly, here was a bit of civilization. The diner had a bright red neon sign on top of it that read, Shelley's Diner. It hurt my eyes, but I could smell coffee coming from inside and that was a good smell. As I shuffled to the diner's entrance, I noticed the handful of cars in the parking lot. They each had Kansas license plates. I walked through the diner's front door like a corpse. I'll be with you in one second, sweetheart, the waitress was saying, and then she stopped when she saw me stumble through the door. I imagine I looked like a corpse as well. Please help us, I said. My voice felt weak. Tears were streaking down my cheeks. There was only a handful of patrons in the diner, and they all turned to look at me. My friends need help. God, please help us. I was in Short Falls, Kansas. That is what the righteous told me when I asked her where I was. I had been in Dutchville, Wisconsin in the morning, and now I was in a small county that was at least 12 hours away. Impossible, of course. There is no way we had driven that far or in that direction. There was no way any of this could be real. But the diner was real. The coffee the waitress had given me was real too. And so were those license plates outside. I told my story to the patrons, and they listened with rapt attention. When I finished, a small murmur broke out in the diner. I could tell by the look in their eyes that none of them believed me. They regarded me the same way one might regard a sick dog. Son. I've lived here my whole life, an older man said, and I've never once seen any Sparrow Road. Another murmur, this one of agreement, broke out in the diner. I don't care if you believe me. Please, just help my friends. There had been a search. The waitress had called the Short Falls Sheriff Department, and they listened to my story, and when I was finished, they looked at me the same way the patrons in the diner had, but they did their due diligence. And they had even called the station in Dutchville, and when they realized that I was telling the truth and that I was from Wisconsin, they did raise their eyebrows. And when I called my mom and they listened to me cry on the phone with her, they did more than raise their eyebrows. It caused their faces to turn white. I stopped looking so much like a sick dog to them. So there had been a search, and a collaboration between the Short Falls Sheriff Department and the Dutchville Sheriff Department was formed. And I had even ridden in the passenger seat with the sheriff trying my best to guide him and backtrack my steps to that terrible gravel road. We drove around that small Kansas county for hours. None of the roads we drove looked anything like the roads I had seen earlier. Those roads were normal roads. They had normal traffic and street lights. But those other roads I had traveled when I fled from Sparrow Road, those had been deserted roads. Quiet roads. Eventually, Jonathan and Rachel's parents both came out to Short Falls to help look. That had been hard to face them, but they had never blamed me, had never once questioned the validity of my story. That had been nice of them. Yes, there had been a search, more than one actually, but it all seemed to blur into one long, hopeless endeavor. And despite how long we looked, we never found any Sparrow Road. Not in Short Falls, Kansas, or Dutchville, Wisconsin. Jonathan and Rachel were officially designated by the state as missing. My story was eventually disregarded as more plausible theories came to light. Theories that the state was more willing to accept. I had suffered some kind of heat stroke, according to the medical experts, that had examined me after. We had gone riding. Maybe there had been a crash, or maybe they had ditched me. Either way, I had gotten separated from the car, and I had suffered a heat stroke. And ended up all the way in Short Falls, Kansas. Sure. And now my two best friends were simply missing. Falling. 
not missing, falling. I did find the well again, however, some years later. I never went to college, technical or otherwise. My parents understood, even if their sloped shoulders told me that they wished I would give it, what's the saying, the old college try. They understood my depression, although we never called it that, spent most of our time talking about it. And so instead of going to college in Madison, I hung around Dutchville, doing odd end jobs here and there. And of course, I would always keep my eyes open for an old gravel road. Sometimes I swear I would see it, only to blink and it would be gone. It was three years later when I found the well again. I was sitting on the back porch of my parents' house, nursing a glass of whiskey. I had actually put off drinking since that horrible day in 76. Despite my depression, I had never really felt the urge to drink. I would felt the opposite, in fact. In my head, I always saw those crumpled beer cans around the well. That had been enough to put off drinking, for a time. But that night in 79 was significant because we were coming up on the three-year anniversary of Jonathan and Rachel's disappearance, and the urge to ease that pain took over. So I took my father's bottle of whiskey to the back porch and began to drink. When I felt that malty drink go down my throat, I realized something. I didn't have to look for Sparrow Road or the well anymore, because the well was inside me, and it was deep. I thought that if I drank enough, if I filled the well enough, maybe Rachel and Jonathan would come rising to the top, rising like a geyser and then come spilling out of my mouth, just as young as the day they disappeared. That had to be true, because the idea of them falling down an endless tunnel for all eternity was too much to bear. You'll always be falling. And so I drank. I filled the well. A couple years later, I had been in a bar, filling the well, when a man in a trucker's hat walked in. The bar owner was upset at the man because he had been late on delivering something to the bar. He was at least a day late on his order. The trucker explained he had got turned around on his way. I'm sorry, Sam, the trucker had said to the bar owner. You know it's not like me to be late. I'm always on time, but I just got turned around. Ended up on some ish gravel road and took me a while to find my way. Strangest thing, a bunch of abandoned cars on that road. What road? I had grabbed the man on the shoulder and he jerked around in surprise. He and the bar owner looked at me just like those dire patrons in shortfalls had, all those years ago. Bella, would you mind letting go of my shoulder? The trucker asked. I tightened my grip. What was the name of that road? I'm not sure, I don't remember. Was it Sparrow? Was it Sparrow Road? I could feel my eyes bulging in their sockets. The bar owner tried to peel me off the trucker, but the harder he pulled, the more I stuck. Hey buddy, ease off. You said you saw other cars. I said, shaking the trucker now violently. Did you see a red one? A challenger? I did, the trucker said. At least I think I did. It was a red challenger. It had a faded yellow smiley face painted on the driver door. I screamed. I passed out. I woke up in the dunk tank. When I got out and headed back to the bar, the owner refused to let me enter. He told me if I kept coming back and bothering his people, he would stop calling the police. He would take care of me his way. I never saw that trucker again. On November 13, 1999, I saw Rachel Lafferty. I was in a bar in Madison, doing what I do best, filling the well. I had gotten exceptionally good at filling the well by this point. If there was a hall of fame for filling the well, I was no doubt a first ballot entry. The Badgers were on TV playing Iowa, and it was the end of the third quarter. The Badgers had started a recent tradition where between the third and fourth quarter, the stadium would play Jump Around by House of Pain, and everyone in the stands would, you guessed it, start jumping around. They were starting that now. The camera was zooming in on one section of the stadium, highlighting the students jumping for joy. What I saw almost caused me to spill my drink. Almost, but not quite. Because a spilled drink can't be used to fill the well. Rachel Lafferty was standing in the very center of the section. Unlike the students around her, who were all wearing red, Rachel was still wearing the faded blue shirt and blue jeans she had worn that day, and there was a piece of frayed rope tied around her waist. None of the other students seemed to notice her. She wasn't jumping. She was staring right at the camera right at me. She was mouthing something. We'll always be falling. Could you turn that off? I asked the bartender, turning away from the television. 
It's the Big Ten Championship. The bartender responded. Then he went back to ignoring me. I finished my drink. Always made sure I finished my drink. And then I got up and left the bar. As I was walking out, Rachel was still on the television, mouthing words silently, and her eyes followed me the way a portrait does. Come fall with us. A couple of years ago, I had been in a Barnes & Noble, perusing their music section. People were giving me the side eye, no doubt because of the way I was staggering around. I had been filling the well early that morning. I was flipping through their vinyl section when goosebumps ran up the back of my neck. When I looked up, Jonathan Belvedere was standing on the other side of the rack. He looked exactly the same way as he did that day in 76. Same blue denim jacket, same blue jeans, same yellow t-shirt. He was fingering through the records casually, as if he hadn't been missing for 40 plus years. Some choice tunes here, Padre, Jonathan said. Good songs to fall to. Then Jonathan began coughing and made a terrible noise like a cat about to spit out a hairball. It also faintly reminded me of old gravel crunching under tires. Then he did spit something out. It floated and landed on my hand. It was a black rose feather. I ran from the store. I have not seen Rachel or Jonathan since either of those occasions. I took a break from filling the well in order to write this, but already I can feel it calling me back. No matter how much I drink, it never fills all the way. But it needs to be filled, and I will keep trying. After all, just like Rachel had said all those years ago, wells are not that deep. Right? Time to fill up. Ten years ago, I dropped out of college. I was 19 and had barely made it through the first semester when I realized that it just wasn't for me. I didn't like being away from home and the prices were just too high. In a pinch, I decided to become a police officer. All they required was a GED and I figured, hell, I can do this for a while to pay the bills. I ended up loving the job. I've been with it ever since and never regretted the decision of leaving college. However, it's not really the most high paying job in the world. Life is expensive and my bills aren't exactly going down. I talked to some of my coworkers and quickly learned just how much I could be making with a college degree. It wasn't exactly a monumental difference, but it was enough to make life more comfortable for sure. I got some advice to enroll in the local community college and decided to go for it. I had planned to start in the spring semester, but my schedule wasn't very flexible. I ended up working some things out with the chief and enrolled myself in three summer classes. Lucky for me, two of them were online. However, the online statistics class was full and the only availability was Tuesdays and Thursdays from 6 to 9. Now, I'm sure you're wondering why the hell I decided to take a nighttime statistics class in the summer. Why not wait into the fall to see if online opens up? Well, I'm required to get a math credit for my criminal justice degree. That seemed like the most obvious choice. But I absolutely hate math. I figured I'd get it out of the way early so that I could enjoy the better classes later on. The summer courses are also only 8 weeks long, so at least I'd be done quickly. This brings me to Thursday. It's my 5th week of classes and, yeah, they're exactly as awful as you'd think. The class is in the basement level of the downtown campus at the opposite end of the parking garage. This sucks even more because the last thing I want to do before sitting in a dark room for a 3 hour math lecture is walk all the way across the building through the maze of a cinder block, windowless halls. A supremely depressing entrance to a supremely depressing class. Well, I drag my feet through the hallways and sit in my regular seat. A hard plastic blue chair in front of a tiny desk. It reminds me of those old desks from elementary school where I used to hide trading cards and gum. Except now I'm pushing 30, and the only thing I'm hiding is how uncomfortable this chair is, and not hiding it well. The only thing that makes this class a little better is the pretty girl I sit next to. I've never had the guts to actually talk to her, but she gives me a lovely smile every time I go to sit down. She has long red hair and bright green eyes, and I learn through the attendance call that her name is Marie. She greets me as usual when I sit down, and I get distracted by the glimmer in her eyes. The professor, an old, balding man, walks in and takes his position at the front of the class. The lights go down and he illuminates his slides with a projector. He's a wrinkly, small man, but today he almost looked older. 
It was as if gravity was pulling him straight into the grave. His skin sagged, his knees buckled, he somehow even looked shorter. I began to count the days until my 30th birthday. I have never been fond of the idea of getting old. He began droning on about something or other, starting with a Z. Z tables, maybe? Look, I know I should be taking my classes more seriously, but it was a long day and I was sincerely beat. I began to zone out, thinking of Marie. I did this a lot. It didn't help that she was always in my line of sight. I thought maybe today would be the day I talked to her. Maybe I'd ask her to grab a coffee. I had to do it at some point. I'd never forgive myself if I chickened out for eight weeks straight. I dozed off into my own little dreamland, and by the time I snapped out, Jesus, it was already 9.05. I might as well have skipped at that point, because I clearly didn't learn a thing. Oh well, I'll just read over the posted notes sometime over the weekend, but it was time to go home. And yet, the professor was still droning on. I raised my hand to let him know class was over. I was more than ready to leave. He glanced at me for a split second and yet didn't even acknowledge me. Professor Smith. I spoke to no avail. Professor Smith. It's five past. He glared at me. I will ask that you please do not interrupt this lecture. If you need to speak, you may raise your hand. Yeah, up this. I don't know who pissed that guy off today, but I was over it. I grabbed my notebook and packed it into my bag before getting up and leaving the stale, cold room. If he has a problem with me walking out, then he should quit talking at the regular time. I walked back through the halls to the building's exit. The hallways were a maze, but I knew the walk well at this point. Left, right, right, left, right, out. On the prison-esque walls surrounding me were various art pieces I assumed were done by the student. I passed one that I hadn't seen before. It must have been new, but it caught my eye immediately. It was some abstract version of a face, I think. It looked like some sinister Picasso. The mouth fell below the chin in a twisted grin. The cheeks were tinged a strange purple hue. The eyes looked foggy white and clouded over. It gave me the creeps, and yet I couldn't stop looking at it. I must have been staring at it for 10 minutes before I snapped out and realized I needed to go home. No one had passed by me yet. Had the old loon really not let class out yet? I turned my last right and headed toward the door under the glowing exit sign. I pushed it open, expecting the dimly lit street, but instead I walked straight into my classroom again. I shook my head in confusion and looked at the clock on the far wall. 6.05 it read. You are late, the old man sneered at me. Kindly take your seat. He began lecturing again, and instinctively, I took my place at my seat again. I was confused, but once again Marie turned and smiled in acknowledgement of my arrival. I turned to her for the first time, beginning to ask what was going on, but as soon as I opened my mouth, she turned her head in some unnatural and slow way toward me, bones popping in the process, and put a single finger to her lips before returning to listen to the lecture. Nope. I didn't know what was going on, but I was going home. I abruptly sat up from my seat and walked out again. No one acknowledged me. I returned to the hallway. Left. Right. Right. Left. Right. Out. But not out. Straight back into the classroom. The professor reprimanded me again. I sat down again. I mindlessly repeated the loop and set back out again. Back in the classroom, reprimanded by the professor, acknowledged by Marie, and out again. I don't know how many times I repeated this loop over and over again. Dozens, maybe hundreds of times. I lost count quickly. Left right, right. Or was it left, left, right? Left, right, left? I was getting dizzy. I couldn't tell how much time had passed. I decided to open the door to another classroom. Maybe by some miracle there would be a window in there that I could climb out of. I entered the room. Of course, I was back in my classroom. What the hell was happening? I backed out of the doorway. As I returned to the hallway, my eyes caught the painting again. This time, I swear it was in a different place. Before, it was on a wall surrounded by other paintings and collages. Now, it was on its own. I know this sounds strange. Hell, all of this does. But the smile seemed larger, the face more sinister. I began to stare, 
transfixed once again. The longer I looked, the more my heart started to race and chills crept up along my arms and spine. It was like it was alive, alive and staring straight at me. This time I ran to the exit, but to no avail, I still ended up back in that horrible classroom. This time it was different. I walked through the door, but no one acknowledged me. I looked at the clock, 6.05. The professor had already begun lecturing and everyone's heads were turned towards him. It was as if I wasn't there. I walked up to the professor, waved my hand in front of his face, nothing. I turned to look at Marie and my whole body went cold. Her face was contorted, her mouth twisted into a sinister smile, her cheeks were flushed a deep purple, and her eyes, once green and glittering, were a pale white, clouded over. As I looked around the room, I saw the same horrible expression on everyone's face. I felt sick to my stomach. I turned as quickly as I could and walked back out the doorway into the hall. There it was, the painting, directly outside the door in front of me. I instinctively backed away into the classroom. What? What the f up? was all I could utter. At the sound of my voice, every head in the class turned to face me. Their sinister smiles and foggy eyes trained on me. I turned tail and ran sprinted as fast as I could down the hallway, not paying any attention to which direction I was going. All I could do was run. As I left, I could hear the scooting of the legs on the plastic seats, bodies shuffling out of the room. I think it's been three days, but there's really no way of telling. Maybe it's been hours, maybe weeks. As I maneuver the maze that is this basement, I sometimes hear them. I hear giggling, footsteps, knocks, sometimes from far away sometimes from what sounds like right around the corner. I know deep inside of me that I have to keep moving. I can't sleep. What if they find me? I'm getting weak, dizzy from the twisting halls. I don't know how much longer I can do this. I want to go home. I want out. Please, dear God, let me out. I work for NASA as an astronomer, and there are certain things we keep hidden from the public. No, the Earth isn't flat, and aliens don't control the government. I wish those were the case, as the truth is much, much worse. In 1993, the Hubble Space Telescope saw a star disappear. It didn't go supernova or die naturally. It simply went dark over the span of a few minutes. This star was already too faint to see with the naked eye and ground-based telescopes had trouble picking it out from among the surrounding stars. But the event wasn't widely known to the public. At the time, we thought the most likely explanation was that a cloud of interstellar dust had drifted between Earth and the star, occluding it from view. It was noted and mostly forgotten about. In 2007, two more stars vanished. Due to the circumstances of this event, this was much more concerning. The two stars in question were part of a binary system orbiting each other at a fairly close distance. If a cloud of interstellar dust was the culprit again, they would have both seemed to disappear simultaneously, or very close to it. Instead, both stars faded individually over a period of minutes, separated by a span of about 8 hours. This binary system was also about 15 light years closer to Earth than the star that had previously disappeared in 1993. After carefully reviewing millions of Hubble images, two more stars were identified which had gone out in the years 1995 and 2002. These were all in the same stellar neighborhood, only a handful of light years from each other. The only conclusion we could draw was that some unknown influence traveling close to the speed of light was shrouding or destroying these stars. Unfortunately, the Hubble wasn't sensitive enough to tell us any more than that. The James Webb Space Telescope first came online a few months ago. Although official channels will tell you it's still undergoing testing, we have been actively collecting data since early February. One of the first things we did was to aim the telescope at the regions of space occupied by the vanished stars. If they were being blocked by dust clouds, a hope some of us still held on to, the increased sensitivity of the JWST may have been able to see through them and confirm that the stars were still there. Unfortunately, we had no such luck. 
the first three stars that had disappeared were still completely dark. Gravitational wave detectors, though, soon found something odd. In all cases, not only were the stellar masses still present, but the amount of mass had actually increased. More sensitive observations had also detected a type of string, or web, stretching through space, connecting these now invisible stars. We trained the telescope on the binary system that had vanished in 2007, which was the nearest point at which this phenomenon had so far been observed. There was finally enough ambient EM spectrum radiation left to try a mass spectrometer reading. If you are not aware, mass spectrometry is an incredibly useful process, whereby measuring the patterns of light wavelengths emitted or reflected by an object, we can learn tons of useful information, such as its temperature, speed and direction of movement, and chemical composition. The readings we got from the binary stars didn't make any sense though. First of all, they were cold, almost as cold as the surrounding interstellar medium. Whatever had happened to these stars had snuffed them out completely or somehow prevented their light from escaping. What was truly puzzling, however, were the emission lines returned by the mass spectrometer. Several familiar elements, such as hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and magnesium were identified, but these were few and far between. Most of the readings didn't correspond to any known chemical elements, and even seemed to defy what we knew about the physics of light, matter, and chemistry. This massive, star-spanning structure was primarily composed of materials that we didn't even have names for, and may not even have been matter as we understand it. Speculation ran rampant. Obviously, such a thing couldn't be a natural phenomenon. Finally, we had proof of extraterrestrial life. But what was this thing we had discovered, and for what purpose was it being built? The leading hypothesis was that we were looking at a series of Dyson shells, massive solar collectors built to completely envelop stars in order to capture 100% of their energy output. Such a concept had been envisioned in the early 20th century as a potential source of energy for an interstellar civilization. Ever since then, the idea had found its way into popular science fiction. The construction of these massive structures had actually been theorized to be one of the first signs of intelligent extraterrestrial life that we may someday detect. It seemed that they was today. The theory still didn't explain everything, though. First of all, there was the impossible speed with which the stars were covered. Constructing a Dyson shell from scratch in a matter of minutes was beyond even the wildest speculations of scientists and sci-fi writers. Then there were the mysterious filaments that connected the shells over distances of light years. No one had any idea what purpose these could serve, or how they could even be built. Everyone at NASA was fascinated by this mystery. In hindsight, we may have been better off if we had never discovered the truth. Less than a month ago, the JWST detected a series of unusual energy bursts emanating from interstellar space. These were occurring at the very edge of a star system approximately 12 light years from the binary system that vanished in 2007. As we focused the telescope on this system, we soon determined that these were not natural phenomena either. The energy signatures, which were still flashing intermittently, matched what would be expected from thermonuclear and antimatter-based explosions, along with several other types of energies that we couldn't identify. These explosions, although still not visible to the naked eye on Earth from that distance, were absolutely tremendous in magnitude, easily billions of times more powerful than any nuke that humanity could conceivably build. After experimenting with the telescope's setting, we were able to get a clearer picture of what was going on. The tip of one of the interstellar filaments that linked the Dyson system was passing through the Oort cloud of the distant star system, approaching its sun. And whoever lived there was fighting back. Their weapons were able to slow the thing's advance, shattering, breaking off, and vaporizing planet-sized chunks of the object. But it seemed to be rebuilding itself almost as fast as it was being destroyed. After less than a week, the explosion stopped. It seems that they had run out of ammunition. In the void between stars, we knew that these things traveled at nearly the speed of light, but as we watched it approach the inner star system, its pace slowed as it swelled in size, preparing to devour the system's star. We quickly trained the telescope's mirrors on the doomed sun. We were about to watch whatever this thing was blot out another star, but in real time. 
We all held our breath as we watched the projected image of the main sequence star, slightly larger than our own sun. At first, nothing seemed to be happening, but soon a small shadow appeared on the edge of the luminous orb, soon followed by another shadow, and then a third one. The shadows began to converge, forming a strange yet somehow familiar pattern as they blocked out the star's light. What are those? One of my colleagues gasped. They almost looked like... She paused, as if afraid to say the next word for fear of ridicule. I, however, had no such hesitancy. Leaves, I said, my voice monotone. The situation was far too incredible to express any emotional reaction, even that of pure shock. They looked like leaves. We watched as, over a period of minutes, a web of shadowy outlines, matching the familiar shapes of oblong leaves and thin vines, proceeded to blot out the remaining light from the distant star. By that point, everyone in the room had realized the truth. The phenomenon we had been tracking for so many years wasn't some hyper-advanced alien megastructure. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and magnesium. Some of the few familiar elements we had detected, they were all components of chlorophyll. It was a plant, an enormous plant that spanned across light years. And, much like terrestrial plants, it sought out light to fuel itself. The filaments connecting the stars across interstellar space were stems, branches. It would grow in the direction of the nearest star it sensed, completely enveloping them and then moving on. Any life inhabiting planets orbiting those stars would be left to freeze to death, or perhaps even worse. It was possible that the plant would devour those planets to add to its mass as well. Everyone was silent as the telescope continued to gather data. Eventually, after what seemed like an eternity, a young astronomer spoke up from the far end of the room, addressing our supervisor. Sir, you've begun to detect the formation of another tendril, leaving the system. Its vector is... He gulped. He didn't need to say any more, but he did anyway. It's heading directly for our sun. How much time do we have? The supervisor replied grimly. Judging by the time lag, distance, relativistic properties, and previously observed speeds of this thing? I'd estimate no more than 27 years, sir. 27 years. We had just watched this galactic weed overwhelm a civilization that was, at the very least, thousands of years ahead of us technologically, and we had less than three decades. I'll probably be found and silenced for posting this, but I don't care. I have to tell someone. I can't keep this a secret any longer. When the sun turns black and the world begins to freeze, at least you'll have some idea of what's going on. Small comfort, it may be. I'm an avid hiker. I've traveled all over the United States and hiked more trails than I can keep track of. Being stationed here at Joint Base Lewis-McChord in Tacoma, I have easy access to everything the state of Washington has to offer. Every weekend during the summer, I make sure to go out and explore somewhere new. One of those trips shook me to the core, and to this day, I still have no idea what happened out there. It was Labor Day weekend, and we were given four days off of work. Four day weekends are the best. I make sure to get as much time away to de-stress in the outdoors as possible. That Thursday morning, I had all of my gear packed up and ready to go in my truck so that as soon as we were released from duty, I could quickly change out of my uniform and head off. Luckily, our company commander is pretty chill, so he let us out early, around 4.30 p.m. That gave me plenty of time to make the three-hour drive out to the trailhead and get in a few miles of hiking before setting up camp for the night. I was going to the Gifford Pinchot National Forest between Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams. When I got there, I put all of my gear on grabbed my trekking poles, and started on the trail. Though it was a four-night camping trip, I was always prepared for up to two weeks in the woods, just in case I got lost and ended up a missing 411. I had plenty of water, a purification system, food, a camp stove, a satellite phone, cordage, flint and steel, a survival knife, and emergency flares. This being bear country, I kept my food in a bear canister and wore a can of bear spray on my hip. 
I was also sure to make plenty of noise to warn any nearby bears that I was in the area. As a backup for absolute emergencies, I also had my Ruger 1911, chambered in 10mm. Say what you will, but I've never had to use it, and I hoped I never would. Until now. That first night, everything was amazing. I set up camp in a scenic location, had a fire going, certain campsites allowed fires, and enjoyed a chilly Mac dinner. It was great. When it came time for bed, I hung up my hood, got into my tent, and drifted off to sleep. Something woke me in the middle of the night. A branch snapping. The sound was loud enough to actually wake me up, though it must have been a big one. Confused, I lay there, listening intently for what that could have been. Then I heard another snap, closer this time. An animal, it must be. A bear? Just my luck to encounter a bear on my first night. Then came the smell. It was awful. A horrific stench, like a rotting carcass. It wafted in and lingered as if whatever was making it was right outside. I heard more branches snapping, but this time, I couldn't pinpoint where the noises were coming from. They seemed to be all around me, but that couldn't be. Were there multiple animals? The horrific thought hit me that there could very well be a group of them outside, poking around. But before I could get worked up, the noises suddenly stopped, and with them, the stench it just vanished. The air was clear again. I thought that maybe in my sleepy, hazy state, I had dreamt it all. Maybe I had sleep paralysis? Maybe. But I laid there, listening until I fell back asleep. The next morning, I looked around my campsite, hoping to find tracks of whatever it was that came last night. I couldn't find any. No footprints, broken branches, no disturbed pine litter. I was completely baffled. How could an animal make all that noise but not leave any trace of them being here? Though it had made me uneasy, I brushed it off and packed up my kit. I continued on the trail, and as I remember, I had a pretty great day. Then it was nightfall again. As I was sitting by the fire, I heard a faint shrill cry off in the distance. It sounded like a woman screaming. A ghastly, blood-curdling scream. Startled. I looked in the direction I thought it came from. I don't know why, I couldn't see anything anyway. It was pitch black out there. The light from the moon and the stars couldn't penetrate the foliage. I thought it must have been a fox, or a lynx. They tend to make scream-like vocalizations. Still, even if it was, hearing something like that while you're alone at night was still terrifying. I was expecting it to end just as quickly as it came, but whatever was out there continued screaming. It made long, mournful wails, piercing through the ambiance of the forest. After what felt like 20 minutes, every rationalization I could think of no longer helped to calm my nerves. I couldn't take it. I couldn't stand hearing it. Then I heard a footstep behind me. The crunch of dry pine litter. I whipped around, grabbing my flashlight and aiming it directly into the forest. I started to sweat as I saw the beam was weak, fading in and out as if it was fighting to stay on. What cruel irony, I thought. I could have sworn I put fresh batteries in the night before I left. There was no way it could be dying now. In the flickering beam, the vast expanse of the trees was a curtain that hid everything from me. I swept it back and forth, watching the shadows sway and dance. There was nothing. I sat and stared, hand on my bear spray, waiting for something to jump out at me but nothing came. As I calmed down, I noticed the screaming had stopped. Then, a few minutes later, the crickets began chirping. Wait, has it been silent this entire time? I realized up until now, the forest was eerily quiet. Other than the mysterious screams, there were no crickets, no wind sweeping the foliage, no owls. Why didn't I notice it was so quiet? When did all that noise stop? Was it ever there to begin with? Completely baffled by what had just happened, I got ready for bed. In my tent, I checked my flashlight again. It was working perfectly fine. The beam was strong as it was before the trip. Must be a fluke, I thought. Though I was on edge, I still managed to fall asleep. But once again, in the middle of the night, 
I heard the sounds of branches snapping around me. They were closer this time, with the footsteps more frantic. Like the night before, the awful smell of rotting meat also accompanied them. This time, it was so strong it felt like a cloud that was right on top of me. But there was something new. It sounded like someone laughing. It came from the same direction as the screams. I was confused at first, but as it got closer, I was absolutely sure it was someone laughing. Or at least it sounded like it. A high-pitched giggling laughter. Like a dog or a hyena imitating a human's laugh. Foxes could make a sound like that. Maybe it was a fox. Maybe the same fox that made the screams. Oh, who am I kidding? This was no fox. I had no idea what this was. At one point, the laughter sounded like it was right outside the tent. But for some reason, I could no longer tell where it was coming from. It was like as soon as it got close, it was somehow all around me. In my morbid curiosity, I sat up, contemplating unzipping the flap just a bit to see and finally know what was outside my tent. But I quickly shut out that thought. Whatever it was, it didn't seem to know I was in there. Maybe if I stay quiet, it'll go away. So that was what I did. I sat and stared at the tent door, waiting, with the can of bear spray in hand. Though of what use it would be, I had no idea. Finally, like the previous night, it stopped. The footsteps and the laughing stopped, and the stench faded away. I sat there for some time, ready for it to come back, but it never did. I must have drifted off after that, because the next morning, I woke up lying down, still holding the bear spray. Searching the vicinity of my campsite, I once again found no trace of whatever was out there. However, my food canister was gone. I suspended it 20 feet in the air, but someone or something had taken it. Regardless, after the previous night, I was completely shaken and decided it was time to end the trip early anyway. I had planned a looping route, but it was faster to just go back the way I came. Still, that meant I had to endure one more night out here, with no food. Just one more night though, that was it. I could do this. The following night, I set up camp again and sat by the fire, warily listening for the screams again. This time, I was in a more open area, a clearing on the edge of a rocky slope leaning down to a lake. The sky was clear, with the moon and stars reflecting off of the water. Still, it wasn't enough to penetrate the forest. It was an abyss swallowing any trace of light that dared to enter. After I sat around for a while, I decided to go to bed early. I still had not heard anything strange, which gave me a bit of relief. I put out the fire. Suddenly, a wave of dread swept over me. As the embers faded, so did the chirping of the crickets, and just like that, everything was completely silent. Then the screaming began again, this time a single long piercing cry. It was much closer and louder than before. I looked up, staring into the darkness of the forest. Against the night sky, I could see the tops of the fir trees. They were moving. I heard the rustle of branches and needles, like they were pushed by the wind. But there was no wind. The air was still, and yet I could see the trees swaying. On the ground, I heard branches and twigs snapping, more viciously than previous nights. The thing was big, and it was moving. Whatever it was, it was moving. It was coming for me. It wasn't being sneaky. It wasn't creeping in the shadows anymore. It was making its move. Like a predator stalking its prey and making the final lunge. But how big was this thing? How could it be so strong that it was pushing the trees out of its way? The noxious stench hit my nose again, stronger than ever. I pointed my flashlight at the entity, trying to make out what exactly I was seeing. It was no use. As soon as I turned it on, light started drifting in and out like it did last night. Frustrated, I slapped it against my hand several times and turned it on and off, but it was no use. The light didn't stay on long enough for me to make out what the shape was. At the same time, the forest was so dense that whatever part of the creature that wasn't blocked by the massive tree trunks was still obscured by the branches and shadows cast by my light. Finally, as the creature came closer to the clearing, and its rough outline was visible, my heart sank. I saw a tall, humanoid figure with long, gangly limbs, but no visible head. 
I couldn't tell if it was the darkness or my mind playing tricks on me, but there were no discernible features on it. It was completely black. In the beam of my flashlight, it still wasn't fully visible. When the light hit it, even though it illuminated the trees, the figure was still in darkness. It was as if the thing itself was absorbing the light. Whatever light hitting it couldn't bounce off, it couldn't escape. An abyss. My flashlight choked out its last breath before finally shutting off. I was now in total darkness, with nowhere to go. I couldn't go around the thing. It was going to grab me. I couldn't go back. There was a drop off. Navigating the rocks with no light was going to get me killed. In the glow of the moon, I saw the figure wrap a gnarled, spindly hand around the last tree, pulling itself out of the tree line. I heard the creaking and groaning and buckling of wood as it lurched its way forward. The eerie, uncanny laugh came, louder and more sadistic. It was inhuman, again like an animal imitating a human's laugh. I froze. Now without the trees for contrast, I couldn't see the figure anymore. I just knew it was in front of me, and it was coming closer. But even though it was in front of me, the sound of its laughter seemed to come from all directions. How? If it was echoing off the mountains, I would be able to tell, but it seemed like the sound was wrapping around me, and so was the odor. With no other option, I had to fight back. I pulled out the bear spray and flicked the safety clip off. I aimed up at what I thought was the thing's face and sprayed, holding the lever down until the entire can was empty. Unsurprisingly, that didn't seem to phase it. The creature kept coming. It was worth a shot. At least I'll go down fighting. It then quickened its pace, laughing maniacally as its body swayed and writhed, its joints creaking and clicking like old rotted wood. I dropped the bear spray and drew my 1911. I always carried a round in the chamber and the hammer cocked, ready to go. Flipping the safety off, I aimed with a firm two-hand grip at the creature. The gun most likely wouldn't do anything, but I had to try. I fired, once, twice, three times, over and over. Under the surge of adrenaline, I barely heard the gunshots as they rang out, but I could feel the force of the creature barreling towards me. Remembering back, I could have sworn I saw it reach out with a spider-like arm, fingers practically touching my head. I emptied the magazine, all eight rounds gone in what was probably the span of two seconds. I squeezed my eyes shut, preparing for what was to come, but right when I thought I was going to die, a sudden gust of wind smacked me. It was immensely strong, and it felt like it was going to knock me backwards down the slope. The wind howled and ripped at my clothes. It was ice cold. I looked up and the forest suddenly burst with light, a pinkish purplish glow emanating from behind the trees. It lit up the sky and reflected off the lake and the glaciers on the mountains. It pulsed and shifted in hue and seemed to flicker and dance like an aurora. I stared, completely baffled by what I was witnessing. Quickly, the light faded and so did the wind and the stench. The forest was dark and quiet again and the creature was gone. I sat on the ground, staring at the forest, trying to comprehend what I had seen. All I could hear was the ringing in my ears. Afraid that the creature might come back, I relit the campfire and waited for it. When my ears finally stopped ringing, I heard the crickets and other insects again. It was the most reassuring sound I had ever heard in my life. For the rest of the night, I sat by the fire, too afraid to go to sleep. When the first light of dawn came and the birds began chirping, I immediately packed up my camp to leave as soon as possible. Finally, I picked up my spent brass and I looked around. I tried to find any sign of the creature's presence, but like before, there were no footprints, no broken branches, no disturbed foliage, no evidence that an enormous creature had been there. I ran the entire way back to the parking lot. For miles, I ran with all of my gear on, disregarding the fatigue from staying up the entire night. As soon as I got into my truck, I drove all the way back to Tacoma without stopping. I had contemplated telling the guys in my unit about what happened, but I didn't exactly know what I would say. I didn't even know where to begin. None of it makes sense. I've searched all over the internet hoping to find an answer, hoping to get some clue or to find someone who has seen the same creature as I did. Like I said, to this day, 
I still have no idea what I encountered out there. But I do know that Washington and the entire Pacific Northwest is notorious for unexplained phenomena. Be careful out there. <laughs>